Eh, continuamos. Sí, eh, con la siguiente intervención en este We caso, will listen to the next speaker, who is Antonio Almagro Gorbea. Antonio has developed a very long professional uh, career in, the, in terms of the architecture of the Islamic art. He's an architect. Uh, he graduated in Madrid in 1971. He's also got a diploma in restoration of monuments at uh, the University of Rome. He's also uh, currently acting as a professor and researcher of the study of uh, uh, the School of Arab Studies, belonging uh, to the High Council of Research of Spain. He was also the head of the school up to the year 85. He's a member of the Royal Academies of Arts of, of uh, Granada and Madrid. And between 1999 and 2005, he was also a member of the Technical Commission of the uh, Council of the Alhambra and the Generalife. And he's also been the uh, director of the Spanish uh, architectural mission at uh, the Palace of Amman in Jordan between 1987 and 1999. And of course, he's uh, uh, been the head of many works. Uh, uh, with regards to the restoration of Islamic uh, monuments in Spain, Tunis, Jordan, Morocco, and he's also uh, he's also written very many uh, papers and and books about 250 papers all throughout these years, specifically and from the Andalusian legacy. For a long time, we uh, I've got to say that we had a wonderful relationship with him and his team. His works, both in terms of the planning and written production, is uh, a true reference uh, in terms of Islamic arts and Islamic architecture. So anyone who would like to know in detail the plans of the main Andalusian buildings we have here in Spain, Antonio will, will come across, you will come across uh, Antonio's uh, name somewhere. The detail uh, with which he works every single uh, element uh, is to be praised. And also in terms of, uh, in pedagogical terms, he's also specialized in preparing audiovisual recreations of the different monuments. We've worked with him uh, on, for example, the Cuarto Real of Santo Domingo, the Umayyad Palace of Amam in Jordan, uh, Madinat al Zahra, so works which have been developed all through the times, but uh, showing how from uh, a serious study uh, these buildings can be uh, brought to light. Uh, and also like to highlight uh, his works in in other countries with corporations, collaborations such as, for example, the, um, the palace of Kuzai al-Hamra in Jordan, the studies of paintings he's uh, developed. Uh, we re-edited that work some years ago. There were wonderful paintings there. But of course, uh, they needed a supporting work in which uh, our author was very much involved. In Jordan, <coughs> he's developed most uh, his uh, most of his uh, research work, and he's also a specialist in uh, palaces and. Uh, And um, with these, I would like to give him the floor. Thank you very much, Immaculada, for your kind words. Also, I would like to uh, thank the organizers of this uh, exhibition and seminar, and of course, the institutions supporting uh, uh, this uh, meeting, Casa Arabe, the Legal Andalusia Foundation, the Council of the Alhambra and the Generalife for the kind invitation to take part in the seminar. In fact, of course, the Alhambra is a, 
a very important uh, uh, monument, uh, there's no doubt about that, uh, because there's a series of circumstances which have uh, configured it, uh, it way, this way, but uh, if we think of its origin, it's been referred to about that, it's a specific uh, uh, Palatine city, a place which was chosen by a king or by several kings to be their sea, the sea of power. We'll see that uh, such condition is no, no that original. In fact, in the Islamic world, in all cultures, many cases of uh, cities which were created uh, to become the sea and uh, maybe in the Islamic world they became very special because uh, we would say here that uh, the Islamic world was very much prone to the creation of new cities. In fact, the Islamic uh, culture is uh, mainly urban, even if it's in, uh, in its origins in the uh, Arabian Peninsula is related to the nomadic world. But Muhammad was a, a, a city man and in fact he uh, developed a religion thinking of a community which uh, uh, could develop its uh, religious duties as a community. And from the very beginning of the expansion of Islam, new cities were created specifically because the dynamism of the Muslim conquest is based in, mo in most cases, not just in uh, uh, violent acts, but also in pacts, the pacts which mean uh, a, a, a certain level of respect for the uh, beings, for the for the belongings of of private persons. Is usually, the only uh, assets and goods which are seized are those of state and those of noble families who prefer to flee. And the fact that the general population stays on the place on the one side means that uh, Muslims cannot easily enter to leave uh, their conquered cities. But also there's a strategic reason and it is that Muslims in that fast expansion which took place in the 7th century are just a, a minority when they become established in the new territory. So the creation of a city, uh, these cities will be referring to as Misr and the prefix Al-Ansar, new cities where Muslim population will uh, be established at the beginning allows for the uh, prevalence of the social cohesion of those groups as compared to the local population, be them Zoroastrians or, or Persians or Christians when they occupy most of the Byzantine Empire. So we could say there's a, some kind of a vocation for the creation of new cities which appears as uh, consistent or inherent uh, to the um, Islamic culture. But there's also an element which is not specific of the, uh, to the Muslim world. It is the trend towards uh, isolation from the power. In the end, power always creates problems or offenses or envies, as always, who envies those who have the power and the riches and everything uh, what is entailed by power. And there's always the wishes of uh, uh, 
uh, of, of uh, the wish to overthrow uh, those who are in power, and that's of course a danger for those in power. So there's always uh, the reaction, the the isolation, defending from that potential danger, always there, always out there, and the first solution would be uh, I mean isolation so this defines uh, the reality of these palatine or court cities they are cities created by the power to become their sea and which uh, are isolated which uh, let them be isolated from the rest of the community and that's one of the characteristics of the Alhambra and as well as of many of the cities uh, I'll be describing some of the cities were created in isolated places, but in some of the cases they were created beside another city uh, they are also trying to control. Well, we'll see that this is not a, an isolated phenomenon. Maybe the Alhambra uh, adds to that its uh, geographical situation, its relationship with the city uh, of dominance which is also apparent in other cases, but it's uh, history, is nature, the beauty created within this Palatine city in the end turns it into a unique case, but from that point of view of a city conceived to become the sea of power is not such a unique thing. And these we've seen that uh, uh, wouldn't, uh, has, has taken place at all times. Uh, I would like to show you uh, an old example, uh, Jorsabad, which was found uh, uh, by the 8th uh, century before Christ by Sargon II in the late Assyrian a period we may see the city with a rectangular shape and also including two embedded palatine areas but the most important one were the palaces and also were the temple and uh, administrative buildings are located also uh, the residence of the servants uh, the immediate servants of the monarch which are their support and also the base of his security. This is a clear example of how this model exists since uh, uh, urban culture was, uh, or urban culture appeared. I also like you showing this example uh, from the third century of the late Roman period. Uh, this is uh, uh, this is Palatum, the current city of Split, uh, from the Diocletian uh, period. It's a kind of an in-between solution in terms of scale, because it's something between uh, a city and a palace. These are the remnants still in place. It's got the scale of a large building, but we've got to say that in medieval times, a whole village uh, lived in the area covered by the palace and the historic district of Split is still uh, made up of the structure of these palaces. The building is got the typical shape of a Roman castrum, the typical campsite built by legions just to, to spend the night, but also to establish permanent uh, barracks and it's also the base of Roman cities, of colonization, Roman cities born out of uh, the original legion camps. Also, we may see the typical structure with the two main streets, the, the Cardo Maximus and the Decumanus Maximus, linking up the four main gates of the, of the uh, present but about a fourth of the area is occupied by the uh, emperor's uh, uh, residence. This palace was built by Diocletian when he left power. 
and the, the forum, the main nucleus of this Palatine city, is occupied by the temple and the mausoleum of the emperor where he was uh, to be buried after his death. And this shape, this uh, pattern, curiously enough, we find it uh, in the foundation of a new Islamic city when after the first stages of expansion took place and the first dynasty of caliphs uh, had been consolidated after the period of the orthodox caliphs when the Umayyads uh, uh, seized power and established a dynasty where a succession takes place within the family we have this city which couldn't be considered to be because also because we haven't got much information much uh, historic information on it but this city which is located in in Lebanon in the plain of the Beka uh, between Beirut and Damascus in the way to the Mediterranean which looks like a Roman city or Byzantine city uh, uh, it could be seen as that at first sight, whereas if it was not uh, uh, for the shape apparent there of a mosque with a mirhab and also there's a large building there clearly and identifiable with a palace, especially because of the reception halls uh, in the building. It is. It, it has ties or relationships with other buildings of the Umayyad Caliphate uh, of the uh, of the East of that time. Elements which would prevail in posterior uh, buildings. Also, we may see characteristic elements of the Islamic period, even if they are coming from the world of the Roman culture. For example, uh, the baths, the hammams, and also we may see a strong commercial element. All streets are lined with small rooms which are shops. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And on top of the old Sergiopolis of Justinian time and old Byzantine uh, period on on top of St. Sergius Sanctuary. It's a city which is uh, partly a military outpost and partly a, a settlement. On this city, Hisham, the Caliph, the, 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 the grandfather of the of the Rahman the first, would build a, a palace not inside the city, where, on the other hand, a large mosque was built. Uh, right beside the Christian Basilica. But his palace would be built outside the city, as in similar buildings of the time. It looks like a, a fortress with its own towers. And the palace in itself is no urban structure, but it follows the typical structure of these Umayyad uh, structures we would be well they're so called desert castles but we would rather refer to them as uh, the palaces of the desert even if many of these palaces had the the appearance the external appearance of of castles with towers I brought this example because it shows against that idea that uh, uh, considering the current uh, uh, the, 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 the structures of the time, the urban structure of the time, that the power power looks for isolated places. But during this first century of the Islamic world, for me the example which is a clearer example of the Alhambra is a site on which we work for many years, both in terms of excavation and uh, restoration. It, that, it is that of the city of Amman. We haven't got much historic information on it. We do not know who was uh, 
the caliph uh, or ruler uh, who commissioned its construction. We don't know if it was uh, a, a Umayyad, ca Umayyad caliph or a, or, a, or a governor. We know, on the other hand, that close to Amman, we have, so there are many of these famous palaces or castles of the desert. So there's an area there. Is an area which was very much visited by caliphs and Umayyad uh, prince, uh, princes. This hill, which uh, is preserved in the heart of, of the capital of Jordan, is the uh, biblical city of Rabat Ammon, the capital of the Ammonite kingdom. In the Book of Kings, there's a series of lines uh, in which we read that uh, David has uh, uh, been has slept with uh, the, the the wife uh, that of Uriah, Uriah, and uh, he would sell a message to uh, he would sell Uriah to his general with a message and the message would tell the general to put him in the first uh, line of the attack uh, uh, so he is killed and that happens right there in this place and it is funny I think it's uh, Mukadasi who would mention when the, the Umayyad uh, buildings were already in ruins they would say that the main building preserved, the monumental entry to the palace, is mentioned as the uh, tomb of Uriah. So in the Muslim memory, all the uh, biblical histories is there. This city became a Hellenistic center. By that time, it, its name was uh, uh, replaced with that of Philadelphia, with the uh, Hellenistic name of Philadelphia, because of, uh, uh, or after the Ptolemaeus Philadelphias, he was fighting the Seleucids, and in Roman times it was it enjoyed a, a, a big development, especially during the Antonine period, when the city spread down onto the valley. In this uh, layout uh, by Conde, one of uh, the English travelers in Palestine in the 19th century, they known it, uh, they knew it before the urban explosion of the 20th century, and it's seen how the main monuments were located in the deeper areas of the valley. And there are very important elements such as different churches maybe a cathedral and a large mosque, uh, maybe the Alhama Mosque of the city after the conquest. In Roman times, uh, maybe there was an Acropolis on top, there are only religious uh, buildings left, uh, 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 a temple to Hercules and another building on top of which the Umayyad palace was built. In Byzantine, in Byzantine times, uh, the city, the, the, the churches show that the city was still uh, an important place. Maybe the city was destroyed by the great Persian invasion of the seventh century, which. Uh, ended up with Heraclius uh, reaction some years before the Muslim conquest. The fact is that uh, by the 8th century, of course this is posterior to the, the, the building of the Umayyad uh, buildings and palace, because we could find a, 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 a coin typical of the reform of Abd al-Malik when the Byzantine and Sassanid models were abandoned, and it's only the, the legends 
which uh, were apparent, the proclamation of the unity of God. So, a coin of this kind appeared in the uh, foundations, ditches in the uh, entrance to the palace, so it shows that its building is posterior to that of Abdel of the, the ruling period of al Malik. So the Umayyads developed the, a, a true city inside because we may see how and the most important area in the hill there's an urban structure surrounding a large uh, uh, central square there's a serial or uh, a series of, of streets uh, ending up in the square and coming from the outer gates and we may see that a third of the area covered by these by the urban core is uh, occupied by the Palatine area the interpretation we have uh, well there's another important element there which is the building of a mosque in a very unique uh, location or layout because both of the Amsar of these uh, starting initial cities it was characteristic of them that the Dar al Islam the governor's uh, house would be built right beside the mosque among other things that said because well it was said uh, uh, that uh, the reason for that was uh, that uh, treasure was uh, 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 stolen from the home because in the mosque there's always pious people even in the evening yeah, doing their prayers and they will be the most uh, the most uh, the safest uh, protectors of the treasure of the community which is being um, uh, guarded in the palace here we do not really know what happened uh, perhaps there was some change in the traditional structures or the idea of separating the religion from the civil power we seem to find them in opposite sides of the square the mosque is on the higher part the upper part and then the great hall of the building of the, of the palace is in fact a bigger building than the mosque here we have the articulation of the square and it is a very interesting and it reminds us of the Hellenistic models uh, and not the Roman models here we see these tangential streets reaching the larger square in the middle we are not sure whether um, this was designed with a purposeful intention or whether it was just the result of uh, reusing existing or previously existing buildings. Here we have the area covered by the palace, about a third of the area of the new city. Here we have the square and then the, the sorry, the mosque and then the square. The square is also uh, the, has a, also a market function. On the two free sides, there are small rooms with gates that were used as shops. We know that Omeyads were great promoters of um, trade and that they um, were, uh, they in fact participated in the creation of many souks because they understood they were an interesting source of taxes. Here, we are not sure of this, but there is an area around uh, an important deposit, a uh, circular reservoir, where nearly all the water 
from the rainfall, well, all the rainfall falling on the palace would lead, would end up in this uh, deposit. But the fact of not having any Omeyyad structures in this area here, although there are some previous structures from Byzantine times, many of them covered or broken, we all this makes us think that perhaps this area was uh, to be a garden. The, here there's a great hall, like a sort of reception area for, for the public audiences. Mm, there's a, here next to it the construction of a hammam, so baths. This also is a structure, a structure that is always present in these Palatine cities of the desert. And as I say this, uh, there's a, this entry hall also with a sort of uh, shape of a, that could be used as a reception or public audience hall too. So we have a an interesting figure and a topography that makes us things, think of the structure of the Alhambra. So we have a new Palatine city built on, on an upper level, controlling a lower city. And I do think this is the way we should interpret this. The lower city uh, lower city would be mainly Christian, because here we're talking about only 50 years after the conquest. So just one generation. And therefore, the lower city is probably Christian and with uh, culture more related to Byzantium. So there is a Palatine city that is uh, built to be the sea of the government. The palace itself has an urban um, structure because of the nine buildings that form it, plus the four residential buildings on the extreme of it from the Sasani tradition with a great hall open on one of the, of the sites towards the courtyard with uh, lateral rooms and this reminds us of a uh, camp with full of uh, equal tents and there's only one element that is different which would be the throne hall the hall of the throne, and this would be following the Sassanid tradition too. Here we have the two elements of the hall of entry towards the palace and the hall of the throne. Here we have another reconstruction, a virtual reconstruction of it. The most significant elements here are this main gate, the entry gate. The gate, of course, is always a key element in all these um, palatine buildings because it is the element that helps establish the relationship between uh, governors and the people um, who are governed. So here we have the temple, uh, as something that reminds of the temple of fa uh, fire in the Sasanic tradition. And here we have a very clear ex example of the origin of Islamic art, an art that is the result of uh, the merging of very different cultural and artistic traditions. Here we have elements that are Sassanid using gypsum and also many Mm, Byzantine elements as well as many main, the architecture elements are mainly Sassanid elements and in the hall of the throne which has the shape of this uh, temple of the fire or this Sassanid temple of the fire has mm, very um, narrow uh, entries and this is uh, curious and the communication between the hall and the waiting area was done by a narrow gate. And this leads to protocol issues. And we do know that in the Islamic world, 
um, there was an acceptance of the Sassanid tradition, and there is this idea of the monarch and the power, and the isolation of the monarch and the power. And of course, all this leads to some negative um, effects because the subjects feel a little bit marginalized as they cannot see the monarch. But then the power takes profit of this and turns this isolation of the monarch into the symbol of power. Therefore, the place where the monarch is isolated, let's think about the Tower of Comares, for example, when you see this from the outside, we can easily create this symbol of um, that tower being the sea of power um, and that this power is not visible to the subjects. We know that the, in Umayyad and Fatimid periods there was a reception that was carried out behind a curtain. So the Sultan was be placed behind the curtain and the audience uh, was on the other side. This meant that the subjects could hear the monarch but not see him. Ahmad al-Hansur still used this um, type of uh, protocol for the audiences. And I think this is also reflected in the architectural shapes. I'm going to try and be a little bit more quick. There are many other examples of this kind of cities, Baghdad, the very famous circular city of Al-Mansur, built by the second caliph after the killing and the Abbasid revolt and the wiping out of the Umayyad, where Abdurrahman the I was the only one to be able to flee and came here to continue the dynasty. Al-Mansur, the second caliph, then built this circular city as a Palatine city in Baghdad. And we only have some literary, li literature references because no remains are, have been kept. The problem with uh, this, if the power decides to move the sea, uh, or if the successors of the, those who built these cities decide to go somewhere else, or if there's an abandonment of the site, these cities are usually totally abandoned, or they end up being used by um, popular people and as uh, dwellings. Around the Palatine city, we've got the, we see the development of the current Baghdad city. In the Abbasid period, we have good examples like Samarra, which is the result of the wish of the caliphs from al mutasi in the year 834. There were, in fact, many problems created by the by the army. There were many um, Turkish mercenaries coming from <coughs> Central Asia, and they, in fact, were the ones that created many many problems, and they, therefore he decided to move uh, 90 kilometers um, up the river Thai, uh, Tigris to place the barracks there and his own um, residence. Here uh, we have uh, around the great palace, Hassan Fanifa, we see the Al Jama Mosque to the south and a great avenue connecting the palace and the mosque. And then all the barracks and residential areas are um, placed on both sides of this avenue. So Al Butasin's successors decided to stay in Samarra and build new buildings 
847 que gobierna entre el 847 y el 861 between 847 and 861 several palaces were built in Samarra on both sides of the Tigris, Istabulat, and many others, and especially in 859, al decides to build a new city at the... This was called al Mutawakilla, and here, again, there's a new palace built and a mosque, the Abu Dulaf, uh, Mosque, with an avenue connecting both of them. And again, the, all the um, trading area around the avenue and also the barracks are built along the avenue. It's very interesting. Al Mutawaki is said to have pronounced the, some words saying, now I know that I am without doubt a king because I have built a city and I live here. This sentence clearly expresses the feeling of all these creations of Palatine cities that took place throughout time. During this same period, in Ifiquilla, in Tunisia, under the Ablagi government, so the emirs and the Abbasid, Mm, governors but, uh, who dependent uh, were dependent of uh, Damascus, but who in fact were as independent as Al Andalus. Well, in fact, here there were several cities were founded away from the capital of Fikia, which is the old city of Kayawan, which was founded during the moment when the territory was conquered. And then this later became again the capital city in the Hafsi period. The, here, two cities were built. One of them is not well situated yet, which is called Alabasilla, and another more important one, Rakada, which is placed several kilometers away from Calabram, which is here. We do not know much about Rakada. We only found the, the main palace, so this area has been excavated. This is similar to what was found in Alja. So this tradition of buildings that remind us of the Byzantine structures. In Rakada, the first caliphs the first Fatimid caliphs lived when Maladala goes to the west to fulfill the Shi doctrine. He would spend some years in Rakada until he stopped feeling safe in the area and then decide, decided to build a new um, city on the coast in a very strategic peninsula because it was totally surrounded by the sea with a small rampart to defend the area connected to the continent. He built a mosque and several palaces that we are going to see in a reconstruction. 
And another important element, which is the harbor with, an, with a protection for the sheep, so that they can be protected by the ramparts of the city. This is the reconstruction, reconstructed gate of the mosque. And this here we have a very clear hypothesis where we can see an element that is uh, repeated in several cases in the Fatimid culture, especially in Cairo, where we see two palaces, a main palace or a big, large palace and a small palace uh, with a courtyard in between used for uh, important audiences. The coast doesn't seem to be very safe either because the Normans seem to represent a threat and then Al-Mansur and Al-Muiz uh, caliphs decide to move their residence again close to Kadawan and there they set up a new city, which in fact ends up being a circular city. Salvara al Mansurilla, that is the name of this city. And some excavations have found part of the one of the palaces with a large reception hall and it is very interesting because it is, it is similar and also some how different to the Medina Sahara buildings. There seems to be a pond in this palace but we probably will not find much more information about this city because Kirwan is being enlarged and apparently the archaeological site is not well protected and will probably be covered by that expansion. So in this reception halls we see these uh, gate rooms that are very typical in Medina Sahara and we also see a different kind of rooms that are more typical of Eastern palaces and in general these will not be reflected in the in Al Andalus except for Medina Sara. Later on the Fatimids enter Egypt in nine hundred and fifteen. And the Caliph al Muid orders, gives the order to build a new city. This new city will be the continuation of other previous cities that had been built in this area. The first city built by the Egyptian Muslim conquerors was called Fusta and it was built next to a Byzantine fortress and then there was the Abbasid governor city, then Katai, the city built by Ibn Tulum with the, its famous mosque and then finally we have the new Palatine uh, Fatimid city and according to the instructions of the caliph, it will be a rectangular city surrounded by a rampart, a main street connecting two gates of the city. With the same names, Labab al Sulaiba, that were used in previous cities, and also in the middle. Around a large square, we see two palaces, like in Matilla, a large palace and a smaller palace. And there's also a, a very wide Palatine area. Around them, 
we find the military structures, the tribal structures of the members of the Fatimid army, and these little by little would uh, be expanding towards the outskirts until a century later a new, more solid rampart would be built with blocks of stone and of which uh, many remains have been kept. Now we go to the Muslim West. We have the case of Cordova with Medina del Cordova, the old Roman city, Visigoth city, and then it became the capital city of Al-Andalus. Abderrahman the first already built a residence with the name of the site where his grandfather had had his palace in Rusafa in Syria, away from some kilometers away from the capital city. And then in the 10th century, with the expansion of the city towards the western outskirts, here we have the limits of the eastern outskirts that are consolidated in the 11th century, but uh, it might probably have had an important expansion towards the east, nevertheless. When Abderrahman III becomes caliph, he decides to build Medina Salfara, which is another Palatine city, a new city, rectangular city, located in a strategic site in the limit between the plain and the beginning of the mountain range. So most of the city is placed on the plain, but the palace of the caliph is placed on the on upper levels and therefore the residence of the caliph occupies the highest point and this allows him to control the territory and the city around the palace these are some reconstructions and up to now we've only been able to excavate one part of the Alcazar, so a part of the palace, and as you can see here, if we take into account the upper part, so the structures linked to the administration and the power of the caliph, we imagine this must be about a fourth or a fifth part of the total area of the city. We interpret, when interpreting the aerial photographs, we can think that the western part must have been the military area and the eastern side must have been the residential area and in the center we think this must have been kept as a big park for hunting or something like that. These areas were reserve areas in general, so that the city could expand in this area. Because here we see that the palace occupies several terraces close to the mountain range with the Al Jama Mosque close to it so that the caliph could attend the prayer on Fridays. There's also a clear hierarchization because we see that the palace is a little bit on the upper level and the mosque is placed on an intermediate level between the Alcazar and the rest, rest of the population. The palace has a public area. The Babal Suda is the great gate with the portico and Jadar al-Jun, the reception area. 
the rich room and the reception hall and then the private area where the caliph lived and the family of the caliph lived too we see the decorations the floorings the house of Jafar, which is here with this wonderful facade, and also these two facades here around the courtyard. So, in the 11th century, the fall of the caliphate and the arrival of the Taifa kingdoms shows us that we still have the idea of the isolated power but not to the point of building Palatine cities. Alfa Eugeria is an example of this, of this remembrance of the Omeyyad palaces. From the outside, it is a Andalusi palace. In other cities like Almeria or Malaga, we see, or in the case of Granada too, as Antonio Orihuela said yesterday, the Taifa palaces, the Alcazabas. If this Taifa Alcazabas, if we compare them to the Alhambra, we see that they uh, have the palace scale and not the city scale. But the Almohad uh, Imperium results once again to building Palatine cities, starting with the capital city of Marrakesh with the Kashba as a uh, present built uh, on the extreme edge of the city with a new area which will enjoy uh, its splendor at a later time. From the Almohad Kashba there's not much left because it was abandoned by the Marinid time. It was uh, rebuilt uh, in the 16th century, we still got uh, the great monumental uh, gate, uh, the Baral now, and the mosque. The fact that there's uh, a mosque within the um, Kashba gives it its, uh, its urban character, the personality of a city appended to the main med Medinat uh, main city, and also in the case of Seville. The southernmost uh, corner of the city is where the Almohads will build a series of structures of areas which include districts, uh, inhabited districts. This was initially built in order to uh, host uh, the army they are bringing over from Northern Africa. And there's a specific element there that the mosque, which would uh, give it uh, the status of a city, will uh, be made a common space both to the Madinat and the Kashba. At the beginning, the mosque uh, was designed to be within the Kashba because the excavation, excavation has sh have shown uh, the foundations of a large gate, uh, but that project seemed to be abandoned and the mosque was uh, provided with uh, uh, with the character of the higher mosque uh, of the Marinat, but uh, while integrated at the same time in the al Qasaba and the Palatine city. <coughs> Very fast now because this in has been dealt with in other conferences. The case of the Alhambra is, uh, of course, that of a Palatine city built in a place where the lower city, from which the lower city could be dominated and seen as the seat of power. The fact that uh, the Comares Tower is uh, raised there and including the um, reception hall comes not as a chance it's a clear manifestation of these ideas that the sultan is hidden is protected is uh, 
just visible through its symbols, the, the, through the place where he's got his C. It's an urban structure with its uh, uh, street network, some of them still uh, from which st we still on which it's, we can yet only uh, formulate uh, some some hypotheses the palace would occupy about a fourth of the area this is one of the characteristics of these palatine cities palaces are there out in many uh, places but this massive presence within uh, or covering a large uh, percentage of the urban area is a clear characteristic of these palatine cities also the existence of garden areas of orchards linked to uh, pa uh, to power which are not just uh, areas for the l for, for leisure but also uh, orchards and places where uh, vegetables are are produced and a source of income. It's a city with its own gates, in this case with its four gates, with its mosque, with its hammams, uh, its public baths apart from uh, private baths. And to finish, I'd like to speak to you about another case which was uh, raised by uh, the dynasty which, as Rafael Lopez Guzman mentioned, uh, sometimes they support each other, sometimes they are rivals, at least in terms of uh, the feats in the capital city of the Marinid Morocco. Ab Yusuf, Sultan Ab, Ab Yusuf, uh, some years after the Alhambra was initially built, uh, he built his own Palatine city, the new Fez of Fazal Jatib, who, who was referred to as the Madinat al Baida. There, we may see the influence of the topography of the geography in and covering about 50% of the old city. The weight of the old city is bigger than that of the Alhambra because there's no no room in the Alhambra to, to uh, build a bigger city. The area of the palaces and the gardens and the orchards surrounding it just reflect what happens in the Alhambra with a mosque of its own, with the Alhama mosque and something which is characteristic of, of many of these cities, the Jewish community, which is uh, sheltered or the, under the umbrella, the protective umbrella of the Sultan and which uh, sets up his uh, its district close to the main palace. The, the Mela in Marrakesh is also beside the Kashba. And as a final element, Marrakesh's Kashba involves a reorganization in the 16th century when the Saudis considered themselves to be the successors uh, of the Andalusian world. The great sultan of this dynasty, Ahmad al-Mansur, creates his own public palace which reflects the court of the lions but in a monumental scale. It is a, a lion's court the size of a football uh, field. Of this palace we've got some information not just in descriptive terms and also but also in terms of images We've uh, prepared a series of uh, virtual hypotheses for its reconstruction. It's a pity that this palace only uh, lasted for about a century. Many of these buildings were not just uh, uh, didn't just collapse, but also were put down in order to reuse the materials uh, under the direction of uh, other dynasties. But uh, this must have been an exceptional. 
uh, uh, precinct which uh, uh, tried to it was a, an attempt to emulate the Alhambra in this uh, great hall of ceremonies of Sultan Ahmad. So that's all I think.